I really feel like this message this morning is going to encourage somebody. We're halfway through the year, last Sunday of June, stepping into July. And I just felt like God put this word on my heart. And maybe this resonates with you. Today's message title is this. It's called Faith When I'm Frustrated. Faith, maybe it resonates with one or two people. Faith when I'm frustrated. Here's what I know. I need this word this morning. And I know that more than one or two people need this word. The, the question I have is, is anybody dealing with some frustrations in your life? Just a rhetorical, are you breathing? Okay, most of us are. There's different levels of frustration, you know? There's, there's, there's the little things in life that irritate you. Like your cell phone service that's slow. Your internet speed is slow on your phone. It drove me nuts this week as I was trying to get somewhere. I didn't know where I was going. I couldn't get Google Maps to load. I seriously started to feel anxiety. Like if this thing doesn't load, I'm not sure I'm going to know how to get where I'm going. We rely so much on technology. There's frustrations like that. There's the frustration of showing up at Chick-fil-A on a Sunday afternoon only to find out it's closed. Come on, you've been there, haven't you? God bless those people, man. Here's the frustration that we're dealing with right now. We've got an eight and a nine-year-old son. To, to the parents of the boys, uh, of boys in the room, you understand this frustration. My kids hate taking a shower. Oh my word, it's like every night it's like pulling teeth. No boys, this isn't an optional thing. And it's, it's even more difficult in the summer because Oftentimes when I say, hey, go, guys, you need to go get a shower, they say, well, Dad, we swam in the pool today. As if going to the pool was like taking a shower. I'm like, well, did you take your bar of soap with you to the pool? I mean, no, you, you still need a shower. And there's these little frustrations, these little irritations in our life. But I would say that there's others in the room that you're walking through stuff. Maybe nobody knows about it. Maybe the things that have caught you off guard, that have caused such frustration, caused you to detour, to U-turn, to, to move in a direction you didn't plan. I know this. There's multiple families in the room that you're crying out and asking God for a baby, but you're dealing with infertility and you're wondering why, and it's a frustration that's caused ache and, and heartache in your life. There's, there's people in the room that, man, your, your marriage is on the rocks. There's struggles at home. Your kids, you can't get them to do right. I mean, it's just one thing after another. You stepped into what you thought was a dream job, but six months later, it's become a nightmare. At home, there's so much tension about finances, saving and spending and trying to find the balance and, and, and enjoying life, but still ma making wise decisions. It's, it's irritating, and it's causing man, conflict in, in your relationships. For others, you're at a season of your life where you had hoped you would be somewhere, but when you look at where you're at, there's so much disappointment. You wonder, God, why am I here? Why has this happened? Maybe there's other things, but I think there's so many frustrations that we deal with. And ultimately, it's not a matter of if we go through trials, but how we go through trials that make the difference. Let me say that again because that was good. It's not a matter of if we go through trials, but how we go through trials that make the difference. And there's a powerful passage from God's word in James chapter one, it's five verses, that I wanna just, I want it to be the foundation for where we go this morning. I'm gonna look there at James one. I, ask, I want you to also do something for me. I, I don't do this too often, but later in the message, I wanna look at Psalm 77 in its entirety. So if you've got your phone, and we'll just do this kind of like a Bible study together right here in the middle of the sermon, if that's okay, message. Go to Psalm 77 on your phone, either BibleGateway.com. Uh, you can use your Bible app. You can Google Psalm 77, and you'll find your way there. Or maybe you brought a Bible to church. It's a neat idea, you know, I don't know. It's crazy. Um, but just bookmark that for a second. And I want to go to that and use that to, to strengthen our faith. And so, so, so have that kind of waiting in the wing, but then we're going to come back here to James. 
And so if you're a new believer in the room, let me just give you some context. All right, so James, five-chapter book. They call James, if you're new in your faith, James is one of the most practical books and one of the best ones to start out at, in, in understanding just foundational Christianity and following Jesus and just stuff that you can take and it's not too hard. It, James just explains himself. And the interesting thing about James is it's called the Proverbs of the New Testament. James is Jesus' half-brother. And it makes me just, it makes the Bible that much more come alive that you would have a, the brother of Jesus describing his brother as Lord. That Listen, I'm never calling my brother, he's a great guy, but he's not, I'm never calling him Lord. And you know, you get to know people a lot by the people they're around or their family. You know, I think about when I first met Jen, I got to know Jen's dad. Man, what a great guy. Man, he loves Jesus. He's a hard worker. He provides for his family. And, and I got to know him and just see what a caring person he was. And man, it's going to be great. And then I got to know Jen's mom. Jen's mom is crazy, everybody. No, I'm telling you, I'm like, I don't, I don't know if this is going to work or not, man. I mean... She loves Jesus, but in a crazy kind of way, and she's the kind of person that she doesn't meet a stranger, and it makes me feel uncomfortable because we'll be at a restaurant, and she talks to the waitress like they've known each other for 20 years, and I'm like, oh, my word, I'm just, my skin is crawling. You know, I kind of thought when I met Jen's mom, you know, I'm asking Jen, are you going to be like this in 20 years from now? <laughs> if so, we might, we might need to talk. I love my mother-in-law. But so often you get to know person by, by their family, the people they're around. And that's what, one of the ways that James comes alive. And he says this in verse one, he says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. He says this, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, what a way to write a letter to your friends, you know, just kick it off with that kind of encouragement. It says, consider it joy when you face trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to, to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. Notice what's so powerful to me. He says, not if you face trials, but whenever, just underline it, whenever you face trials, whenever you face trust, frustrations, it's not, it's not a matter of if, but when, and how you work through that that makes the difference. I, I think oftentimes in our life, frustration kind of raises its ugly head as, as an unmet expectation. It, it's the feeling we have when what we hope for doesn't look like what we're experiencing. You hear me today, church? Frustration, we, we believe for something, and we ask God for something, but what we experience look, looks different. And we, we plan for something to go a certain way, but we see things in another way, and it creates frustration in our life. Maybe think of recently, you know, Jen has this love for nature, and she loves cardinals. And so, she made a decision, I think I told you about this, we bought on Amazon this bird feeder and put it out on the front window, and Jen loves in the morning. She'll sit and, and do her devotions, and we've got this bird feeder, and the, and the birds will come, and she'll just enjoy nature, and it was going great. Uh, it, it was so awesome, man, just the, the birds were coming. It was going great until last Saturday night, everybody. I, I was home alone, by my, just, just there by myself, and the boys were with my parents, Jen was with her mom there at an event. She was coming home late, and it was about 9.30 at night. And I, I think I've told you before, I don't like being home alone. I was home alone, and I actually, I was just kind of setting my mind right for, for Sunday. And I was playing the piano, and I was just spending some time worshiping in the front room, when all of a sudden, I heard this loud bang on the front window of our house. That's right, I, I, I immediately be became uh, just at unease, I guess you could say, you know? And I made my way slowly as I was getting my phone ready to call 911. And uh, I peeked through that front window to look and see if maybe there was something in the bird feeder. And I look, 
and there was something in the bird feeder, but it wasn't a bird, everybody. And what I saw next sent me off the ground, about a foot off the ground. I looked into that bird feeder, and there was a giant, I mean, giant rat, everybody, in my bird feeder. Oh, my word. I'm and it was about this big, I promise you. It was that big. This, it, it gets bigger every time I tell this story. I, sh I shined a light on the bird. I banged the window. Nothing would work. I called Jen. I said, babe, as soon as you get home, you're going to have to take care of this. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I mean, I ain't going out there. And I had already made a decision that by the time Jen got, got home, I was going to talk her in. That Listen, as of tomorrow, that there is going to be no bird feeder on our house ever again. As a matter of fact, I pull up the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, which says this, look at the birds of the air and how your heavenly Father feeds them. We don't need to be feeding the birds, all right. The bird feeder is gone at the Morris house. <laughs> And sometimes you put stuff out there believing for one thing and what you experience and, and, and realize looks totally different. And it creates a frustration in your life. And some things are more, way more weighty than a rat in your bird feeder. So, so some things you're walking through are ca causing such pain in your life. And oftentimes what happens if we don't deal with it in a heavy way, we begin to place that burden on God as if he did it. As if it, it was his fault. And I think that's such a lie from the enemy. Let me tell you this if you're taking notes. Trials are not God's way of punishing us. Some of us feel like, man, God must be mad at me. All this stuff I'm going through. Maybe I've done wrong by God. We've all done wrong by God. Let me tell you, it's the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ that loves us despite our sin. It's not God's way of punishing us. Number two, trials are not God's way of leaving us on our own. Let me tell you this, it, it, it's impossible to escape the love of God. He's in my yesterday, he's in my today, and he's in my tomorrow. And I just want to encourage somebody who's walking through frustration of your life. It's not what God has done to you. Maybe it's how God is growing you through it that you need to recognize. That maybe on the back side of what I'm facing right now, I'm going to be better than I was if I hadn't dealt with it. This week I was just in my reading plan and I read Psalm 77 and I just felt like I don't do this that often. I just wanted to walk through it with you together. Is that okay this morning? Either way, I'm going to do it, all right? Psalm 77. And just kind of buckle your seatbelt. It's, it's 20 verses, but I think it's so powerful, and maybe together we can grow in this. Because it spoke to me, man. It was, I just had this moment where I was listening to it. On a, a, the guy talk in the, in the Bible reading plan, but, but I almost had to stop it and go, God, what are you saying to me? Because it was, it was so powerful. He says this in verse 1. I cry aloud to God, I cry aloud, and He hears me. In times of trouble, I pray to the Lord. All night long, I lift my hands in prayer, but I cannot find comfort. When I think of God, I sigh. When I meditate, I feel discouraged. And I want to stop right there because somebody in the room, that's the place you're at right now. You're seeking God, but you're not... You're not experiencing what you're seeking God for, and it's causing you to feel frustrated and discouraged. He goes on, he says in verse 4, he keeps me awake all night. I'm so worried that I cannot speak. I think of days gone by and remember years of long ago. I spend the night deep in thought. I meditate, and this is what I ask myself. Will the Lord always reject us? Will he never again be pleased with us? Let me pause right there, and this is how I do. I'll, I'll usually just take two or three verses and go, okay, God, this is what your word says, but what are you saying to me? And this is what I think he's saying to us, is that some of us are living life looking at our rearview mirror, and we're looking, we're looking so much at our past going, why isn't the way it used to be? Why am I not experiencing things like I did back then? And instead of reaching out and, and looking to what God has ahead, we're so stuck in the past in, in, in circumstances of our life, he says in verse 8, has he stopped loving us? Does his promise no longer stand? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has anger taken the place of his compassion? Then I said, what hurts me most is this, that God is no longer powerful. Let me just stop because I think this is a painful place. 
And there's seasons of our life where I think some of us, we have more questions than we do answers. We're struggling. We're asking God, why? Do you not love me? Is your promise not good for me? Do you not understand what I'm going through? Why aren't things working out the way they seem? But I love what happens. It's almost like there's this halftime break in Psalm 77. And I love this in sports because oftentimes at halftime, it gives the opportunity to regroup. And sometimes a team that struggled for two quarters can walk out in the third quarter and they look like a totally different team. I mean, they just drank miracle juice at halftime, you know? I mean, they just walk out and they're just making everything, you know? And that's what happens in verse 11. It says, I will remember your great deeds, Lord. I will recall the wonders you did in the past. I will think about all that you have done. I will meditate on all your mighty acts. Everything you do, oh God, is holy. No God is as great as you. And let me just give you some context because he's going to go into verse 14. He's going to start talking about the miracles of God. And the psalm writer, he's going to start reflecting on God's faithfulness in the past. In particular, the story where Moses brings the Israelites out of Egypt across the Red Sea on dry ground. He says, you are the God who works miracles. You showed your might among the nations. By your power, you saved your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. When the water saw you, O God, they were afraid. I like that part right there. And the depths of the sea trembled. The clouds poured down rain. Thunder crashed from the sky and lightning flashed in all directions. Verse 18. The crash of your thunder rolled out and flashes of lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. You walked through the waves. You crossed the deep sea, but your footprints could not be seen. You led your people like a shepherd with Moses and Aaron in charge. And it ends right there. And here's what I love what happens. The psalm writer, notice what he does. He looks back in the middle of his darkest moment and he says, God, wait a, wait a second. I don't feel right right now. But when I look back, I can't help but think about your faithfulness. Because when you stepped out and did that miracle and you looked at the waters, they shook. And they stood and they honored you as you walked across and led that people on dry ground. And God, I believe this, that if if you could bring the Israelites out of Egypt, I believe, God, you can bring me out of my depression. And God, if you can bring the Israelites out of Egypt, God, you can bring me out of my broken life. And God, if you can bring the Israelites out of Egypt, God, you can bring my broken marriage out of its mess and set it in a better place. God, I believe you were faithful in the past. And God, I believe you're going to be faithful in the future. Let me ask, does anybody believe that God is faithful in the room? Come on, somebody. Do you believe that this morning? Sometimes when all you're experiencing is frustration in the middle of your mess, you got to look back and see, God, you've been good in my past. I believe you're going to be good in my future. And I'm going to trust that even when I don't see it, I still believe that you're faithful. I want to give you four things this morning before we go that help us walk out our faith even when we're frustrated. Number one is this. We consider it joy. Number one, we consider it joy. And I think this is foundational. It's not in your notes, but if you want to write it down, it's probably good enough too. We need to understand, everybody, when it comes to joy, that our mood is the byproduct of our mind. Our mood is the byproduct of our mind. For many of us, we often let our mood dictate the direction of our day. Instead of walking out Romans 12 too, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Letting my mind... Letting my mind control the direction, not the circumstances, the things all around me. It, it's, a, it's what I allow to flow in me and through me that makes a difference in my life. I want to illustrate it for you this morning. I love this device. You probably love it like we do, the Keurig. It's an amazing, it's an amazing, whoever invented it, what an amazing invention. I don't drink coffee, but my wife loves it. I use it actually I, I confess to you, I drink hot tea at night. I'm getting old, all right? I drink this sleepy time tea, and it's great. So I just use it for tea, but it's amazing what the Keurig can do. And I, I looked up some of the top flavors of 
K-Cups. You got cinnamon, uh, Cinnabon Classic Cinnamon Roll. I don't drink coffee, but that sounds good enough to drink. You got Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, Barista Prima Coffee House, 8 O'Clock Coffee. You got Caribou Coffee, Caribou Blend. This is an interesting one. You got Death Wish Coffee K-Cups. Who starts their day with <laughs> Death Wish? I don't know. But I love this one. The Donut House Chocolate Glaze Donut Coffee. Come on right there. I don't drink coffee, but I'm telling you, I think I can muscle that one down right there. And here's, here's the amazing thing about the Keurig, is that all, this thing gets filled with all the same water. But I get to control the outcome. I get that, that, that's what makes this thing so powerful. I get to control the product by what I place in the Keurig. And whatever I place in the Keurig dictates what comes out on the bottom. Do you see where I'm going with this this morning? There have been times where I went to make my hot water from my hot tea, and Jen had left her coffee K-cup in the deal. And my first sip of tea was nasty because I was having half tea and half coffee. It drives me crazy when she forgets to take that thing out. But the powerful thing about this is that what I place in there controls the product that I receive. And I have the power to place what I want inside the Keurig. This does not control what I consume. I control what I consume. Here's the deal. Some of you are being controlled by what's all around you, but you have the power to allow what goes in here. And what I let goes in here controls the way I live my day. And I got to make a decision that I'm not going to live based on my circumstances or on my frustrations. I have the power to be led by the, the Holy Spirit. Him in me is the hope of glory. I can walk in joy despite what I see around me. Happiness is based on circumstances. Joy is based on Christ. Somebody give God praise this morning. Come on. And so you can either drink the death wish or you can have the glazed donut, all right? It's your choice. Let, let, let's live in joy. Let's count it joy when we go through trials. Number two, faith won't always change the outcome, but it will change my outlook. Faith won't always change the outcome, but it will change my outlook. And I, and I say this, and I think this point is so powerful because I think some of us, our faith is dictated by the way we see God respond in our situations. And so when things work out in our favor, our faith is high, but when things don't go the way we had hoped, we struggle. And what if we could get to the point in our faith that we say, God, no matter what, I'm gonna trust you. No matter what, I'm gonna believe you. You know, James 1, 2, it says this, when your faith succeeds in facing trials, notice what it doesn't say, everything will work out okay. When, you, when your faith succeeds in facing trials, it's just going to all go the way you would hope. No, he says, when your faith succeeds, the result is the ability to endure. I don't understand it. I don't see it. I, I, I don't even know why it's going the way it's going, but God, I choose to trust you. So God, help me not be so focused on the outcome. Change my outlook. Help me not to be focused on the outcome. Change my outlook. Number three is this, seek God for wisdom. Two more thoughts before we wrap it up this morning. Seek God for wisdom. And I think this is powerful because sometimes we seek God for the answer we want instead of the wisdom that we need. You know, we go to God like he's a genie in a bottle. You know, I mean, here's what I want, God. Instead of seeking him for the wisdom we need. Here, here a week ago, my son, Caden, he's nine years old. He approached Jen. And he said, Mom, I'm wanting this game. I want, I want to download this game on the iPad. And we have this filter set up so that they can't download anything without our permission. And so he was just doing everything he could, begging, trying to, you know, buy it. I mean, he was just all kind of crazy with her. And 
she had some real check and red flags, maybe some things she had read. And so she didn't just give him a hard no. She said, Caden, I want you to go pray about this. I want you to, I want you to talk to God in, in, in hopes that maybe she could kind of soften it and also that maybe he would realize this isn't the best thing right now. Well, I didn't know that all that had happened. And so a few days later, here this week, we're, one evening we're at the pool and we're swimming laps together and we swam a lap. We're at the edge of the pool just sitting. Caden and I were talking to each other. He said, Dad, I'm really wanting to download this game. Tell me what the game was. He said, I've been praying about it. <laughs> he said, Dad, I want to download this game. I've been praying about it. And God told me that it is okay for me to download this game. <laughs> Come on. Anybody got kids like my kids? Come on. Listen. They're trying to pull the God card on me. He said this. God told me it's okay for me to download the game, but he wants me just to check with you first, just to make sure. <laughs> well, I'm not going to be able to go against God, am I, Caden? I guess you're going to have to download the game. No way. Sometimes we go to God for the answers we want when God's placed wisdom all around us. Understanding... You know, I doubt God is going to disagree with the parents who have wisdom to speak life into your situation. And I think sometimes we're chasing God for answers and God's putting wisdom all around us. Hey, let's be people of wisdom. James, he says this, ask God for wisdom. If any of you lacks wisdom, ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to him. And then number four. See the opportunity in every difficulty. See the opportunity in every difficulty. In verse 12, he says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Here's, here's one I, I want to say to somebody in the room that's, facing frustration. We're, there's some people in the room, we're at the halfway point of 2019, and some of you, your 2019 hasn't gone the way you had hoped. Be honest, there's people in the room that you're ready to just throw in the towel for the year. Let's just go ahead and get to a new decade. 2020, come on, bring it on. Because your frustrations, your unmet expectations, your disappointments have been greater than you can bear. And you need God to remind you today that, God, I need, I need to trust you even when things don't go the way I hope. God, grow me in the trial. Make me stronger. And God, help me to walk through this knowing that you are faithful even when I don't understand. I just want to pray for you today. We just take a moment and bow your heads as we close this morning.